Lee, Blaine Fowler, from his very, very prestigious study. He's been reading a ton of books. I hope somewhere in there, Blaine, there is an explanation about why Jerry Palm still has BYU in his bracket. Yeah, yeah. Jerry's book is it's it's up up here, um, and I've read it. I've read I've read I've read every book in my library except for. Well, there's a couple right here I haven't read yet. I haven't read that shelf, but every other book I've read, and I don't, yeah. and I don't know what's in that jar right there. But <laughs> let let it be known that I that I'm a avid reader, and I've read every book in my library. Yeah, with those, every, those few exceptions. Yeah, no one owns a book they haven't read. <laughs> <laughs> that is 100 percent false. You buy the books <laughs> you think you want people to think you read, right? Yeah, oh, exactly. I like exactly. how Journal of Discourse is in there too. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you got to have that there, of course. And I've read that cover to cover multiple times. Just Clearly, so you know Orson Pratt, on. incredible. Yes. Yes, yes. Our well-read, all-star, <laughs> dual-thread analyst, Blaine Fowler, is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Blaine, in all seriousness, I'm looking at Jerry Palm's bracket, the CBS lead bracketologist, and he still has BYU men's basketball firmly in the field, which is exciting, but he's kind of on a hill of his own. So, why do you think if BYU does get in that they will get in? What's the case for BYU still at this point? Well, he's been consistent all year. And if you kind of go back to the very beginning of the year and as the league got kind of going after the non, non-conference schedule, he was always saying, hey, I think the WCC is as strong as they've been. Uh, Four-team, you know, four-bid league this year, strength of their non-conference. St. Mary's, Gonzaga, San Francisco, BYU. And so he hung his hat on that early, and he's still hanging his hat on that, saying that, hey, that loss to San Francisco um, wasn't as, you know, wasn't an awful loss. Um, and he also must be having holding out hope that the NCAA tournament committee actually does what they say they do, and they value the entire season. So they go back and look at the good wins for BYU and look at the season in its entirety and maybe don't hold that horrific week um, with an upside down exclamation point around the Pacific loss in that terrible week of two losses, actually terrible couple of weeks um, that that really derailed uh, BYU season. If, If it wasn't for that week, even that one week, they would be firmly in the field in everybody's bracket and we wouldn't be on a bubble watch and we wouldn't be doing any of this. And so, so why do I think Jerry Palm's doing that? I think he, he took a stand early on that the whole season mattered. He took a stand early on that the WCC was a strong league this year and should be rewarded for that. And he, and, and he, and he still thinks that that's a possibility. Um, but the rest of us are on bubble watch like no other. And it, and it, and it doesn't help when Oklahoma beats Baylor Right, that an 18 and 14 team, and it doesn't help when Virginia Tech beats Notre Dame and St. Louis wins and Miami wins when they're not supposed to win. Like, why are we even watching those things? It's because we go back to that week that I'm talking about, and otherwise, we wouldn't even care what those teams are doing right now. I'm not watching those games because I don't believe BYU is going to get in. I wish they would, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not watching with the same interest I would if BYU had beaten San Francisco, right? Which is tough because. Yes, if BYU beats Pacific, there's no quad three or four losses. And if BYU beats Santa right. Clara, that's a fifth quad one win. BYU's in. BYU's in. May have that, not even needed the quarterfinal uh, game against San Francisco. Who knows, right? Who knows? Yeah, and, and I, th- I think with, with a San Francisco win, we're not bubble watching either. I think right. with a San Francisco win, we're going, they're not on the bubble. That that game was huge. And let's face it, San Francisco's good. Yep. Like, I – as we watch them you know, up close and personal in the tournament, they've got they got all of the makings of being a really, really good team. They've got size. They've got great guard play. They, they have all of that. I remember saying um, the night night before they were going to go up against Gonzaga, let's see how Shabazz does against um, the Gonzaga guard line. Yeah, he was ridiculous again. Bouye wasn't quite as good, but that's a really good team. Um, and, and they're better than BYU right now. Uh, they might not be better than BYU if BYU had – everybody that they had at the beginning of the season, the whole league might have been different if you keep Harward and, and Gavin Beckshire, but they don't have them. And so we are on the bubble watch. One thing I noticed in my bubble watch though, good to be in the big 12. You know, that's like, here, here we are with Oklahoma at 18 and 14. There's seven 11 in league play. And we're talking about with that win over Baylor, there's a possibility they're in the tournament. Get a lot <laughs> yeah. more leeway when you're in that kind of a league. 
and you think about BYU's record, you look at quad one wins, you look at all of that, and you would think, well, wait a minute, BYU's record and, and their resume should be significantly at Oklahoma, but no, because Oklahoma is in the Big 12, and that's valued, and an 18 and 14 team with a 7 and 11 conference record is in consideration. So that, that's the difference. BYU has that to look forward to in a couple of years, and I think we'll find out that 18 and 14 is not that easy, and 7 and 11 the league's not that easy in that league. Yes, and I hope uh, BYU can get seven wins in the Big 12 in 18 games. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. it's going to be oh, brutal. Yeah. Like, how many – who are you beating? Uh, you're hoping that UCF stinks. How many games are you playing with them? You're hoping you can – it's super tough. It's super tough. So, yeah. yes, it's going to be a learning curve. We're going to be cashing checks we've never cashed before as, as a university. It's going to be awesome. But, yeah, if you can go 7-11, have a different, decent non-con, it's a totally different model – that Utah embraced a couple years ago and in basketball still hasn't quite figured out. But obviously in football, they go easy in the non-con most of the time and then get after it in conference yep. play. That's how you do it. And and I, and I will say that that um, basketball is a little easier. To, to be really good in basketball, with the way the transfer portal works now and big-time recruits work now, it's not like football. In football, I mean, you need 40 guys. You need 40 really good guys. You Not only do you need to be good in your – um, uh, and I'm talking on each side of the ball. Not only do your your 22 starters and specialists need to be good, you almost need to be du- double at every single soft trade position. In basketball, if you have three crazy talented guys and a couple of role players, you can win a lot of games. So if you if you can get those guys and something, so it's not quite as hard to turn things around. And I think BYU is going to look really different two years from now um, than they look right now they got to go out and and they've got to find some guys before they get in the big 12 or eight. We'll, we'll be going. We wish they were seven and 11 in the league. Blaine Fowler is on BYU sports nation. Blaine, I know you're dialed in on BYU women's basketball as well. And looking at ESPN's bracketologist, Charlie cream, he has BYU as a five seed. Why do you think BYU is a dangerous team as they approach the NCAA tournament? Because I've heard you say that about them. They're a dangerous team. Why is that? Yeah, I, I think they've been underrated all, all season long. I, I think going into the tournament, you know, they ended up with that 15 rating right there as they entered the WCC tournament. Um, and and I, there's one exception to this. They didn't do this in the game against Gonzaga, and maybe it was a little bit of pressure, and maybe it was good for them. Like, I'm not so sure that Mark Few was sad that, that Gonzaga lost to St. Mary's, um, you know, a, a week or so ago, because it, was a lot, it allowed him to get their attention and to say, listen – you know, we're not without flaws. So let's, let's work on these things and shore them up before we get into the turn. I think Gonzaga in the long run on the men's side is going to be better for that loss to St. Mary's and, and has a chance to get to the final four again for BYU's women. You know, I think that they were maybe thinking, man, we're, we're unbeatable. We're flawless. We don't have a weakness. Um, But what's very apparent is their guard play has to live up to their talent level for them to be good and great guard play wins tournament games and Shaley Gonzalez and, P- and Paisley Harding and Albiero and, and Graham, who's a shooter on the outside. They, they all struggled in that championship game against Gonzaga. And maybe that's an eye opener. Now they can get to work and they can return to who they were all season long when they only lost two games, um, you know, leading up to that championship game. I think they have the guard play. I think they're physical enough and have enough size that they can make a, a big statement in this NCAA tournament. Teams with great guards win tournament games. Uh, now, let's so let's take that Gonzaga game out of there because once in a while, everything doesn't fall for you. Um, I think these guards are going to turn around now and play with a chip on their shoulders and and correct what they did in that in that Zags game. And that's the formula for success. Their guards are so good and so experienced, they will win games in this NCAA tournament. And I, and you know, if they're not in the Sweet 16 and possibly the Elite Eight, I'll actually be surprised. Yes, because this team went to the second round last year, lost a close game to Arizona in a game when went Paisley Harding out a broken hand, but played through it. Unbelievable. Right. Yes, it is Sweet 16 for this team. The expectation is to win two games. And that's even if they're a six, I think, right? If they're a five, obviously oh, yeah. you play a 12 and then you're playing a four or 13. We still expect BYU to win that. Even if BYU is a six, we expect BYU to beat a three in the second round on their home court. The expectations are high yes. for this group. 
Yeah, and, and like my expectation is Sweet 16 is the baseline. They just have to be who they are. They need to play relaxed. Guards need to, to defend and, and shoot the ball with confidence. Um, the, I, I think Elite Eight is not out of the question for this basketball team. Sweet 16 to me is the baseline. They have the talent. They, they don't have a lot of weakness unless they shoot the ball horrifically, um, which they did in that Gonzaga. They yeah. literally, I, we're talking about Paisley at three of 15 and Shaley at seven of 18, Albiero two of six and Tegan at one of six. Yeah. I mean, the team shot 32% and 22% from the three point line. And, and, and Gonzaga is a good team defensively and, and, and at least as a game plan, knows them as well as any, and anyone 48. That's the one beauty of the tournament. Um, it's harder to win in league when you play against teams that they know your coaching style. They know what you like to do. They, they're, they're better at taking you out of the things you do best. They're most familiar with you and really good coaches like Lisa and like Juddy. It's a great job. It's always a tough matchup in league play, especially when you're playing a team for the second or third time. Right. And so in the tournament teams are playing in for the first time, they're going to have a heck of a time trying to control that guard line for BYU. So Sweet 16 to me is the baseline for this women's team, and Elite 8 is not out of the question. I will not be surprised in any way, shape, or form if this is an Elite 8 basketball team. Blaine Fowler is on BYU Sports Nation. Let's end with spring football, Blaine. What's the latest from the Cougars? Because we've been so focused on basketball, rightly so, it's March, that now football's kind of faded to the back. They're still doing their thing in spring football. But what's the number one storyline right now happening with BYU spring football? Uh, there's a couple of things. The, the offense, really good. They look like in regular season form, not in spring form. And that's kind of always the case when you have a returning starter at quarterback. But they don't just have a returning starter um, in Jaron Hall. And by the way, watching him right now in spring ball, like watching him yesterday, compared to last spring, he, he is so much further ahead in, in how quickly he's making decisions and how quickly he's getting the ball out. Throwing the ball with confidence and accuracy and velocity, he, just, he looks really good. He's And you know how we reserve the word elite for very few people on this show, That's right? That's right. <laughs> and, and we, so in spring ball, I'm gonna give him the elite tag. He looks like an elite, elite quarterback on a national level in practice and, and I've seen a number of practices already and he's the, the good news is he's surrounded with depth at every single position on the offensive side they do not have a position without talent and depth on the offense defensively is where I've been watching to see if we can shore up some things on the defensive side of the ball watching specifically the D-line and and I'm convinced now after two weeks that there's some new guys that are going to have a a big impact. Hey, Logan Fauna, we, you know, we talked about him. He looked really good yesterday in practice and they have some youngins like, like Mitchell, but the guys that played last year's young guys, big, fast, nasty dudes right now. I'm talking like Nelson Mangelson, baddies bigger. So I, I think they're going to be really good in the D line. And, and as I watched that linebacking core was a strength to start the year. Starters were the strength and they just didn't have the depth to hold on as they had multiple injuries at that position. So now what I'm looking at is, has that depth last year that had to play, are those guys developed enough that if they have injuries, they're going to be better? I think I think they've shored that up. So defensively, I think they're going to surprise some people. Offensively, I don't know that it's a surprise. This should be a really good offensive team. I think everybody expects that. Defensively, I think they're going to be able to do a lot more things because they're deeper. I think we'll see them play more aggressively, play more man, you know, it's all based on what they see on the other side of the ball. If you're seeing a spread team, you, the way you play a spread team is to, to play more coverage and drop more people. They play fewer of those kinds of teams this year. I think they have the personnel to man up and get after a little bit more. So I think defense will be a pleasant surprise. Offense will live up to expectations. Everybody expects them to be good. Defense will be better than people think. Next year's the year I've been looking forward to. Last year, I thought they'd win eight games. So I think they overachieved, even with all the injuries. This year, I thought they'd win 10 games, and, I, and I'm sticking with that after two weeks of spring ball. I think this is a 10-win talent type of team. Let's go. All right, Blaine, uh, you've covered everything, and now you need to get back to reading behind you. So we're going to let you go yeah, back to I, your study and figure some things out. Sports, <laughs> sports is all good, but once in a while, I mean, this whole shelf right here, that right there, that's all philosophy, and I need to get back into philosophy. <laughs> I failed a philosophy class at BYU, fun fact.
Yeah. Well, yeah. Socrates, yeah. Plato, you know, those guys, morons. Oh, I love Plato. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh, that's like... Wait, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very obscure reference to a movie, and I got to see if you guys know <laughs> Hi. That's that's the great that's the great Vicini from the Princess Bride. Oh yes, that's goes, right. You've heard, of, you've heard of Socrates, Plato, and he goes morons. Moron. <laughs> so. Inconceivable. Yeah, I don't think he knows what that means. Morons. Yeah, Blaine, good to talk to yeah. you, man. Hey, that's never started war in Russia. Yeah. yeah, never started land war in Russia, and never. Uh, what do you say? Never started land war in Russia, and never. Um, uh, Challenge a, a, a Sicilian? Yeah, Never a challenge Sicilian a when death is when <laughs> death is on the line. <laughs> a Sicilian. Never challenge a Sicilian when death is on the line. When death is on the line. Then he goes, ha ha ha. Falls <laughs> over. So, oh. Princess Bride. I love it. Great stuff. Blaine, thanks for letting us uh, celebrate Friday the right way. 